<laughs> one of these days, oh. no one is going to like that name anymore. And be like, Carol, now you're tanned. What are you going to do? Hey everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at the game Majoris by Haba Games. So I'm Mandy, also known as the Board Gaming Pinup Girl. And I'm Carol, also known as Carol Has No Tan. <laughs> every time. <laughs> so uh, as we mentioned before, we're going to do a gameplay overview and review of the game Majoris. Excited about this, won't give away too much, but before we get to all that good stuff, we wanted to talk about what's down below. We have timestamps so you can find what you're looking for. And if you want to leave us a comment or questions, you can also leave them down below. So I think we're ready to take a look at Majoris. What do you think? Let's talk about this because I like this game and I want to see why. Okay, so we'll save that for review, but let's take a look at the gameplay. Develop settlements and delight the gods using workers to obtain materials for huts or temples. Player with the most points wins. So now we're going to take a look at the components for Majoris. So here we have all of the player colors. So there is like a turquoise, there's purple, red, and a lime green. You'll notice there are more in the purple and the turquoise because these are used in two player games. So they do have a couple more huts than the rest. That leads us into, these here are the hut tokens. You can take a look at those. And each of the colors have those. We have the workers which are here, look like they're celebrating. We have the temples, each player has two temples and these come apart. Score markers, so if you go over 100 or 200, depending how good you are. And we also have the point tracking tokens. Next we have the rune stones and we have a few different symbols. Okay, so those will be placed to the side of the board. We have the druid token. Next, we have the die, which is going to help us determine what supplies we get or don't get in some cases. Then we have the bonus tokens here. And then we also have the player shields. And these fold open and they have a nice player aid on the back. Finally, we have the supply chits or tokens. We have wood, we have wool, which I always seem to want to call cotton. So <laughs> this is wood, this is cotton. We also have copper and we also have stone. Finally, we have the board. Now the board is two-sided. This one we've placed uh, here is for two to three players and you'll notice the size of the spaces are actually going to be a little bit different than on the other side, but we have the two to three and on the other side is the side for four players. Now we're going to take a look at how to set up for Maduras. So we've partially set up here already. We have the supplies out on the board. Next we're going to take the druid and place him starting at the top in his little tower. Each player will take a shield and their choice of color. So for our purposes of demonstration, we're gonna work with the two player setup. So we'll be using the turquoise and the purple. So now that we've set up our colors, we're going to have the rune stones available and we'll talk about how those come into play, but you won't have them accessible to all players. Then you should have six of the different types of bonus tokens. So what we wanna do is we wanna place them randomly on the board. So it's total random. We just kind of mix them around and then we just place them on different areas of the board. Okay, so once we've done that, now normally this would be covering all of our player stuff, but we want you guys to see. So we're just gonna place that here so you know it's available, but normally, yes, players would not be able to see what resources you would have, and those would be held behind your player screen. Next, you would make sure that all the supplies are in their corresponding areas. So where there are their symbols, that's where you want to put the tokens. We don't start with anything on the board as of yet. Have the dice, excuse me, the die nearby, which will allow us to find out what we're getting or losing. And set out our two temples, all of our huts. And in this case, but we're playing with two players. We'll be playing with 12 huts in a two player game. And then we have our three workers versus in the other games, the workers we get two. So with two players, we get three workers. 
Each player starts with one of each resource. And again, these would be behind the screen. Then, in player order, after you've determined who's going to start, each player will place one of their worker in the area of one of the supplies. Bearing in mind that you can stack your workers. We'll talk about why that becomes important later. First tournamenters, we're going to show you how to do a small yield. So the small yield happens by rolling the die. This happens at the start of every player's turn. So you roll the die, and whatever number comes up, in this case it's a whole bunch of, it's hard to see here, so it's white, but in this case it could have been a green or it could have been a gold, whichever was rolled. So in this case it was the white, which means that any player that is in the white area, or in this case it's wool, would receive that good. So it just so happens to be my purple worker, so I receive this good. If I had rolled something else, such as a negative one, I would have had to remove something from my supply and put it back. You can also gain, everybody would gain a supply, and like I said, there are other colors, so depending on if your worker is there, will determine how many you're allowed to get. So if I had rolled a gray, two people would be getting it, the blue and the purple would get one each. So if that wasn't enough materials for you and you would like to gain more, the next would be to do a big yield. So this is one of the actions you can do. So rolling the die for the small yield has to happen. Every player has to roll this when they start. The next few actions are choices. So the big yield. So I said, hmm, I need more supplies. You can actually take one of your workers and move it to another stack. Here we are three workers high in the copper area. I love this because these are super shiny. But yes, we are in the copper area. So if I decided to move my worker to this spot, now I'm gonna get more resources. So it starts with the player on top receiving three, which is me, one, two, three. And I would gain those. And because I have a worker in the second spot, I would gain another two. And finally, the player who is at the bottom, which happens to be the turquoise player, will gain one. So three, two, and one. And you do it in that order because these uh, supplies are limited. So you wanna ensure that you're doing an order so the people who are supposed to get them, get them. So that would be the big yield action. In the event that you decide you don't want to get more resources on a turn, you would then decide after rolling the die for the small yield, you would then decide to perhaps build a hut or build a temple. So on a turn, a player can decide to build a hut and you can place this hut anywhere on the board. Sometimes it's beneficial to place it on one that already has one of the bonus tokens on it, which is great. So if we decide to place it on one like this, this is gonna give us two victory points. Some of these ones here allow us to not have to pay for that location. And finally, this bonus token here allows us not to have to give offerings to the Druid, which we'll talk about shortly. So in this case, I'm gonna decide to place it on a spot so I can show you how it actually works. So let's actually put it here. So I decided to place it here. The symbols on the board show a wool and a copper. So that means I have to pay those two resources in order to put my hut there. So then I would take one wool, one copper for my supply and add it to the main supply. And that's how I would build a hut. Now, in doing so by building, the druid will actually move. In the start of the round, he starts on the stairs, so he's got a few places to go before he will come to me for an offering. Also, the symbol on the board, which matches the area here because I built there, I now will acquire this rune stone. So these are worth points during interim scoring and end of game scoring. So that will stay with me. These can be stolen, however, if another player decides to build in that area. So on the next turn, after the player has rolled for their small yield, let's say Turquoise decides that they would like to build beside me. This is where things get a little tricky. Not only do they have to pay for this supply, they have to pay it twice. Every time you build beside another hut, regardless of the color, you have to double or triple or quadruple the cost depending on how many huts are beside it. So in this case, this would be tough. I don't think I would be able to afford it because it would require two wood. Okay, so it would require two of these and it would require 
to copper. Something of note is that if you have three of a material, you can trade those three in for one of something else. So obviously it would be three from your supply, so if I had three copper, I could trade those three copper in, if I so choose to do so, for, let's say, a stone. So this is something that you can do. Now, every time a build happens, the druid moves. Once this person's built here, they would now actually steal the runestone from me, so I no longer have it until I decide to build in that area. Now, if I decide to build a temple, which is the next action, Unfortunately, I'm not able to steal that back, but I can build here. This is important because when the druid moves for collection or to receive offerings, this does not count as part of a run. It almost stops that run of temples. So to build here doesn't triple or quadruple, it's exactly what's stated. So I would have to pay a stone in this case and a wood. And that was actually gonna score me at the end of the game depending on how many temples are attached to it. Building this, however, still requires the druid to move. So after a few turns, after people have paid and built, and so forth, the druid moves. So when the druid now moves off the last step, he comes to the first temple. He said, wait, where's my offering? This is something of note. So if you are in a run, so you are with other temples, you will definitely want to pay it. In this case, if I pay one of the two supplies that are, or resources, excuse me, that are showing on the board, so in this case, it's wool and copper, will get me points. So in this case, if I only pay one of the supplies, one of the resources that's shown, I'll get one point. If I pay both that are shown, which I absolutely will, I will get two points because I have my temple and another. So that would give me two points. If I paid none, I would lose points. However, I wouldn't be able to go into the negatives. The druid then moves to the next available temple and basically is asking for offerings. So this person would also have the same options as this person in order to gain either one, two, or negative points in this case. It would stop here because the druid does not take offerings from the temples, but strictly from huts. If there are empty spaces, the druid does not stop here. He stops at that last hut until the next build where he'll move again. Now, after the druid has made it around the board, there is something called intermediate scoring when he gets to the Great River. This happens when the druid passes the Great River. So what would happen? He would pass the Great River to the next available hut. In this case, it would be here. But we stop and we do an intermediate scoring. So you look at how many rune stones each player has, and each rune stone that the player has is worth one point each. You calculate the rune stones, and then you add it to their score. The game continues like this until a player has built all of their huts and both of their temples to start end of game. All players will have one more turn, and then the round will be over. That doesn't end the game, however, because the druid makes one final run, which means he will be stopping at every single hut that's been built, gaining offerings. So on the druid's final circuit, you place the die from where the druid is starting. So from here, the druid is gonna make the rounds to receive offerings, and he's gonna go all the way around until he comes back to here, intermediate scoring does not happen. So he goes to each, asking or taking offerings. Now, what's really important to note is if there's someone has a long run like this, this is fantastic for later, but do keep in mind when he comes to you, you're now gonna have to pay several times. Blue would play once here, but they can, if they pay both supplies, they'll get one, two, three, four, five, six points, and so forth. Purple, same thing, but now we've got three in a row, so you have to make sure you have all of those supplies ready for you when the druid comes around. So he's gonna come all the way around until he comes back to where he started with the die. Anybody who has temples for end of game scoring, this is great because you're gonna score one point for every hut that is attached on either side of your temple. So these are quite important. Doesn't matter the color, you'll notice that you can place them, making them more expensive for people to build, but you will acquire end game points 
depending on where you've placed your temple. So this is very strategic. After the Druid has made the final circuit, you'll also have to calculate the rune stones. Rune stones are fantastic to have because the larger groupings you have, the better. It starts with one, plus two, plus three, plus four. So you can acquire quite a amount of points for having a large collection of rune stones. So once you've calculated your temples, your huts, your rune stones, the game is over. Player with the most points wins the game. Okay, everyone, so now we're ready to give our review of Majoris. So, what'd you think, Carol? I like this game a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I went into this not expecting to like it mm -hmm. because, well, Hab has been doing this thing where they're trying to get more into like gamier kind of games and not so much into kid dexterity stuff. So I right. thought, okay, like Karuba, you know, you got lucky, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. That, they're on to something, I think. Oh, I, I just, I agree with you. Yeah. I, like, I really liked it. I liked yeah. it. Like, I just, okay, so for those who don't know the story, which you wouldn't, I played this game several times and I played with a few different people and <laughs> we had a couple opinions that they were happy to not play this game ever. And I thought that was a little harsh. I liked it. And maybe, we, okay, let's be fair. I did win the first time we played. <laughs> that could have nothing to do with it. But I like the game. I don't know. Like people say it didn't have enough planning. I disagree. I think, you know, in the game, you have to be prepared to have your offerings ready. So you have to manage all of the, you know, the wood and, you know, copper and whatever supplies and resources you're getting. You have to manage that for the druid, the druid when he comes around for his offerings. So, I mean, to me, that's a bit of planning. And I'm not a planner, but, you know, I managed to pull enough together for some end game scoring, which pushed me ahead. Exactly. Like the game is a delicate balance of knowing when to hoard all the resources so you're prepared for when you have to give the offerings and knowing when to build things and where to build it to. Like there's so much going on, but it's so simple and there's an expectation and that pressure of the druid coming to to your little house or your <laughs> I forgot what they're called, their temples, are yeah, they? Temples, yeah, temples. Your temples yeah. and your huts. It's the huts where yes. it kind of runs down the line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're you're prepared. You know what's going to happen. And, you know, there's only a certain amount of resources, so you kind of have to fight for it, which is interesting with, like, the workers that you have to pile on top of each other, which sometimes, you know, you're going to get the, uh, the the die roll and then it benefits only you. Right. And, yeah, like, a little bit of luck, a lot of planning. Yeah. It, with, it With an interesting worker placement. Like, it's, oh, it's, it's unique, but not entirely new, which makes it really interesting for me. Yeah, so I, I agree 100% with you. I like the little, you know, stacking of the men and, you know, you're able to get resources that way. And then when you roll the die, you know, it was great because sometimes nobody got any resources. So that's where that kind of luck comes out where you're situated, right? And um, I like the fact that you have to pay more for your huts when they're beside another hut, but you can get lots of points if you're able to, you know, give your offerings to the druid every time he hits one of those huts. So that's like major points all the time. So to me, that's great. I love games like that where you can score big, you know, as long as you're managing managing your resources properly, you'll benefit. Now, I did have some issues with the rule book. Yes, not only with the layout, but the wording. <sighs> I was like, oh, I got excited. I saw the colors and I'm like, oh, colored tabs. And then I'm like, well, wait now. I had to like open it and open it again. I'm like, oh no, you lost me there. You lost me <laughs> right there. And it felt like three different people were writing that book. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that it folds out in such a weird way, like it's it's like you're flipping back and forth and when you're trying to wrap your head around it, it's like, okay, well now I'm lost because now I have to flip over to this side and try and read right. it. Again. I did feel that some information was like placed later and it should have been placed earlier in the book. So it, it was a bit confusing. I mean, it wasn't a difficult game, but I did find that the rule book made some things not as clear as it could have been. So, I mean, to be fair, it's probably a translated. It seemed like it was translated. So. I just feel like it could, that could have been done a bit better. And that I think may have increased maybe some people's enjoyability of the game. Maybe just getting through the rule book is enough to kind of turn them off a little bit. So, I mean, that wouldn't deter me as I'd be frustrated, but yeah, that could be a reason. Exactly. Well, we we luckily knew how it was played because uh, you played with the Gamma, right? <laughs> I actually didn't. I actually got a chance to see it, but I didn't get to play a Gamma, but I played it a few times when I got back here. So okay. other different player counts. And um, I know when we played, I liked it at two, to be honest. Yeah, and I like how there's a reverse side for the board when you have two or three players and then when you get to the higher player account. Right. Yeah, so I, I 
two player played really fast, but it was still fun. Like I was worried about the uh, having that competitive edge, but I I actually really liked it at two. Yeah, I did too. I found it just as competitive as if we were going to be with more players, but you know, it's it's much faster. So you know the druid's going to be hitting your your huts and your temples much quicker because it's only your building or the other player's building. Exactly. And also quality of components. I mean, Haba's known for having great uh, qual like components and this was no exception. Like, I mean, all the wood and the pieces, like the little men were wood, the huts were wood. I mean, I thought it was really good. I liked the art as well. I know some people were not crazy about it. I liked it. It reminded me kind of like watercolors a little bit. So it had that soft feeling. I mean, it went with the theme of the game, I thought. Yeah, exactly. And I have to give them props for choosing really great player colors. I really like the teal and the purple to it. They're the perfect shades that I look for in the game. <laughs> they went together so well. And I know some people probably don't like that type of color palette, but it lent, it lent itself to the theme. So I thought overall it was bang on for that. So that was my opinion. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> do you um, have any comparable games? I couldn't really think of any off the top of my head. I couldn't either. Like, I, there's parts of it that feel familiar, but I can't think of what it might be off the top of my head. But it's right. intuitive in that way, which is the interesting part. Mm -hmm. I almost wonder if it's like a Feld game I'm thinking of, potentially. I don't know. I just feel like there's a game where you have offerings or there's something that passes by where you have to give either it's money or resources. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank, but... Yeah, but definitely nothing that can come to mind where offerings happen almost every single turn. Right. It would be like a once in a while thing, but not every single turn. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I did I cover everything? I feel like I'm missing something. Uh, we talked about the components. We talked about the rule book. Uh, we talked about the gameplay. Uh, I think we got it. I think we did it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> overall, I like this game. I know a lot of people we're not crazy about it, but then I wonder if that, like I said, had something to do with the way the rule book was written. Did they play it correctly? So I understand it's not going to be for everybody. Maybe it lends itself to my artist, my artistic mind, but um, I enjoyed the game. And I, I think I actually like it at two as my best player count. It might also be because you played with me, Mandy. No. <laughs> I can't, I can't. So <laughs> no, I really like this game. I love games that after you play it, you get that one more game kind of feeling. Right. Oh, I want to play this again. I want to try something different. Or like, oh, like I should have done this. And that's what the game left me feeling. And by that alone, it, you know, it means I like the game a lot. Yeah. So I think people who are more, maybe have that like, I don't know. And I don't want to say like logical mind, because we all have that kind of mind in a different way. But maybe there are some people who are strictly planners or mathematically need to calculate everything out. You're probably going to have a difficult time with this game. You can't really do that. But it's the random element in it, which I enjoy, because I like being tactical. I, I don't like having long term planning and just have that, you know, right. <laughs> go nowhere. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it. If you have people who are like those, that type of player, they may not, and I don't know if they'll enjoy it as much as we did. Yeah, but I'm not I'm a more planner. go with the flow. Yeah, yeah exactly. right. <laughs> and that's like the art. It's go with the flow. So maybe I don't know. Maybe that's why we liked it. So so yeah. overall, I like you. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our review for Madurth, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>